everyone. I'm James Milan, and welcome to this Talk of the Town, a legislative update with not one, but both of our state representatives. Uh, that is Sean Garbley and Dave Rogers are joining me, and thanks to you both for being here. Good to be here. Great to be here. We do, yeah, we do appreciate it. Um, we love to um, chat with both of you individually or together um, whenever we can. And generally, we've settled on a rhythm of, you know, once per season, uh, four times a year. We, we, we certainly work uh, to get a, an update from the State House from both of you. And with that in mind, because as we were discussing before we, we went, we started recording, um, you know, things have happened since we last spoke to you. But we're also very interested in kind of looking forward, especially as we're at the kind of at the point where we're looking towards the 2021 20, 22 legislative session. So what I'd like to do is ask each of you to briefly uh, just pick a couple of uh, highlights or uh, particularly compelling issues you've been working on or bills that have been passed uh, from these last months and uh, share those with us. And so, in other words, a focus from uh, the last time we talked to you to up till now, uh, and then we'll shift our focus for the balance of the conversation to what's to come. So let me ask you, Dave, to go ahead and start um, with, again, two or three uh, of the things that you'd really like to share with our audience that have happened uh, since we last spoke to you. Sure. And thanks for the opportunity. Uh, I guess, uh, you know, despite the pandemic, uh, and having to vote from home, like like all other aspects of society, the legislature has been disrupted by everything going on. And uh, uh, despite that, we've been able to get a lot done. Uh, a few of the things I'd highlight is a sweeping climate change bill. Uh, the governor vetoed it, so we had to come back in this session and we teed it up as uh, one of the very first things we did. It's a sweeping bill. Um, referred to as the roadmap. It gets the Commonwealth to net zero emissions by 2050. Uh, it does so through lots of different methods, one of which is to increase the renewable portfolio standard. That's the percentage of clean power that our large utilities have to um, um, get from, from clean power. Um, and we increase the amount of authorized uh, offshore wind to its grand total now of 5,600 megawatts. And to frame that number in a perspective the audience could understand, um, that's enough to power over 3 million homes. Now, that won't happen overnight. These are large, complicated projects uh, to get the permitting and the regulatory piece of it done and to actually construct the um, windmills the, and, um, and then to run underground cable from... Oh, we lost... Shore. So these are large, uh, the groundwork, uh, laid the groundwork for um, Massachusetts to have really a booming offshore wind. Um, we increased appliance efficiency standards um, and really many other things. So that's a wonderful bill in the wake of uh, another thing I'd highlighted in the wake of killing of George Floyd and many other acts, tragic acts of um, violence by the police around the country we passed a sweeping police reform bill like the climate change bill, that's a comprehensive bill, has lots of different provisions. The main one I'd highlight is an independent civilian review board. And so while the, the new law has many features, one of the most important, I would say probably the most important is there'll be a brand new state agency, completely independent, so not controlled by law enforcement, but uh, independently um, uh, managed that has uh, pretty sweeping powers to certify and decertify police officers, has subpoena power. Uh, the public can uh, lodge complaints directly with the commission. And um, that new bill also has significant limits on the use of force um, and many other uh, features on police training. So it's a sweeping bill. Um, it was difficult, you know, even many Democrats voted against it, uh, but we got it through and um, that was another key uh, recent development. Uh, the election bill we passed is a big deal. It, it led to record shattering turnout. So um, we passed a vote by mail law, obviously with the pandemic wanting people not to, to vote in person. So from a, a public health perspective, 
having uh, safe elections as well as um, elections where we could get a lot of participation. And it led to literally record-breaking turnout, even in the middle of a pandemic. And we just extended it for town elections, like we're just held in Arlington and Belmont. So um, that's another major uh, development. And we'll probably make many of those changes permanent. Certainly, I'll be pushing for that. And um, so I don't want to go on at too yep. great a length. Those are three major bills. There are many others. Uh, but I think that that'll give you a flavor for some of the big things we've done and and uh, happy to collaborate with my partner, Representative Garbley, in, in getting those things done. Absolutely. And uh, before I let Sean uh, speak for himself, um, I will uh, just add that um, that, as you said, Dave, each of those three uh, pieces of legislation is really sweeping and you could have picked a whole bunch of different provisions uh, to highlight, but we We could have talked the choosing. whole show about nothing but one of those bills. They're, they're large, they're complicated, but um, <laughs> absolutely. I won't. But they, but there's, there, you know, my conversations with local officials also show how much those bills dovetail with lots of what's going on here in town. For instance, right. the net zero action plan that we've developed in town really has some aspects and facets of it that are informed by, but also connected to the larger goals of the of the legislation you were just saying. And of course, we know what you just said about the town voting, uh, you know, having more of that option of uh, voting, absentee voting, um, and then making that permanent is something that people are really interested in and have responded to. Uh, here in town in an active way. So appreciate you you kind of pointing out a number of things that really connect to our community as well as being uh, effective throughout the Commonwealth. Uh, Sean, uh, let me ask you to just weigh in um, from your perspective uh, in the same way that Dave just did. Great. Well, you know, first, thank you so much for interviewing both myself and uh, Representative Rogers. And this uh, certainly uh, is has been a exciting start to the session. Representative Rogers mentioned several pieces of legislation that we took up early. Um, all three of those pieces were absolutely critical, and I'm proud to have worked with him uh, and the rest of my colleagues to make sure they uh, became law. And when the governor sent them back with some amendments that we rejected many of those amendments and, uh, you know, kept with the legislative intent on all three of those important pieces of legislation. Um, Rep. Rogers mentioned the, uh, the roadmap bill, uh, certainly an incredible piece of legislation, especially on the, uh, the matter of offshore wind that's really going to set Massachusetts apart from the rest of the country. We really will be the leaders on offshore wind um, which is just so very, very important for our future economy here uh, as a commonwealth. Uh, one of the great things about being the chair of the Global Warming and Climate Change Committee is we're having several oversight hearings uh, to make sure that we hold accountable this administration for meeting each of those important goals uh, that the legislation uh, mandates. And that is going to be a really important task. You know, I was here in the legislature in 2009 when we passed the Global Warming Solutions Act, which was an outstanding piece of legislation as well. But it's really, really important, uh, just as much the theory of the legislation as the implementation. And so it really is going to be critical that we hold this governor this administration and quite frankly, future administrations to the to the legislation and what the legislation uh, mandates, um, you know, in, in terms of lowering emissions and, uh, and other important standards. And uh, now with a friendly administration at the federal level on the issue of procurement of offshore wind, I think uh, Massachusetts will be in a position to lead on offshore wind and, and other important areas. Um, he mentioned the police reform bill. I, I don't want to uh, just parrot what Rep. Rogers said, but I, I associate myself with his remarks. Um, these are just outstanding bills. And he also mentioned the, uh, the voting piece of legislation. Uh, as he mentioned, we extended um, the vote by mail provisions until the end of June 
because most of the local elections are done by the end of June. Uh, we do have municipal elections in uh, September and November, the preliminary and the general in many areas. So my hope is, and I, I, I fully expect, that we, we will be taking up a further progressive and omnibus voting rights bill that will extend mail-in voting, or as Rep. Rogers mentioned, permanent. And I think that is really, really important. The only other bill, uh, well, two other bills I will mention. Um, one is, uh, you know, we have all watched in great horror and much disbelief that is what has happened with the Department of Children and Families recently in the news with the death of uh, David Allman, 14-year-old boy who was sent home, not ready to go home, um, and it led to his death. And so the House of Representatives actually before that atrocity, that tragedy took place, passed a really comprehensive children uh, protection bill around strengthening DCF and really mandating uh, that DCF do more to protect children in the care of the Commonwealth. I serve on the Foster Care Caucus. As you know, I was adopted, so these issues uh, are really important to me. No child ever in the custody of the supervision of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, um, life should be threatened, let alone taken as uh, David Allman was. Um, we have a committee on children and families. They've just had a 10-hour uh, oversight hearing with Commissioner Spears at DCF and a number of other stakeholders to find out what went wrong and to make sure that this never happens again. Um, and it's not a pretty picture. Uh, DCF failed in many, many ways and it's coming out now that there were staff social workers in DCF arguing that David should not have been returned to his home, um, that the setting was not appropriate care, that uh, his life would be in jeopardy, and that the, the family was not ready to be reunified uh, with David. And uh, because of uh, management or other types of situations that um, will arise with further, with further investigation. Uh, David was reunited with his family um, inappropriately, and this be due to a very unsafe conditions in his home, not healthy conditions, just conditions not fit for human habitation, let alone a 14-year-old boy. Um, this led to his death, um, and it just should not have happened. So the, the legislation that we have passed around the Department of Children and Families, I believe, is a strong one. And I believe the legislature is going to take further action on the negligent care in this case, uh, but also making sure that kids are protected not only during this pandemic, but in the future as well. Um, and the only other really piece of legislation I'll mention, and I'll, I'll be quick about it because I think we're going to go into further detail about it, and that is the 47 something billion dollar budget um, that we just passed that is really a, a great achievement uh, for the legislature during very difficult times. Uh, revenues continue to grow in the month of March, the month of April, which has allowed us to make some very key investments on things like the Student Opportunity Act and on mental health, disability services, um, and you know, increasing state support uh, for the first time in many years around the uh, UGA, uh, which is the Unrestricted General Government Aid, which is really, really important. So um, I, I can go on further on the budget, mm -hmm. but I also want to be mindful of Representative Rogers' time as well. Yeah, so just like we lost uh, Dave's uh, audio uh, briefly during his uh, uh, dur during when he was speaking earlier, I'm afraid we have lost his image as well uh, for the moment. So let me just carry on with you, uh, Sean, until Dave returns um, by asking, or first of all, by noting, I'm really glad that you said, and this goes all the way back to the beginning of what you were talking about, 
uh, that a big part of governing and a big part of legislating is uh, is monitoring and staying vigilant about implementation. And uh, so it, we are all used to out here in the public hearing big pronouncements and legislators after very hard work, justifiably and understandably celebrating the achievement of the passage of a bill, et cetera. Uh, and again, taking some, some credit for that where it's due, et cetera. Uh, but uh, we hear relatively little about that incredibly essential and vital work that you were describing that goes on that doesn't make the headlines that simply is you guys doing the job that you need to do in order to make sure that the benefits accrue uh, in the way that you intended um, from the legislation so really glad that you just reminded us that that is a huge part of what you you do and your responsibility is so uh, you were just describing some of the aspects of the budget that you passed, and we have Dave back, so let me just throw it out to both of you. Um, what are the the pieces of the the budget picture that are most promising or exciting for you guys, as and and specifically as they relate to Arlington? Um, so, for you guys, in terms of the populations you represent. Um, and the benefits for Arlington specifically. Dave, we haven't heard from you for a little bit and we thought we'd lost you for a sec, so why don't we start with you? Sure. Well, um, we were able to get a number of local earmarks uh, in the budget for the Jason Russell House, for instance, uh, for um, the children's room, which is uh, near and dear to, to my heart, uh, uh, collaborating with Representative Garbley, uh, uh, there was some money for the children's room, which for folks in Arlington who are watching and aren't familiar with it, uh, provides grief counseling to young people who've had a trauma or a tragedy um, early in their life while they're children. And so um, it could be someone's sibling died or they lost a parent or something of that nature. I lost my father when I was just 12 and I, I visited the children's room a couple times. It's a remarkable place, remarkable work they do. And I remember thinking, I wish they had something like that when I was young. Uh, so it was great that we could get some money for, for them and some other local earmarks. Um, and then I think, you know, generally the people that I'm privileged to represent care about a lot of these bigger things that we worked on. For instance, uh, uh, as was, as Sean mentioned, the Student Opportunity Act, that's sort of a once in a generation transformative um, new law, the biggest reform in education since 1993, which invests significantly billions of dollars in our K through 12, our public schools. So we know that particularly in a sort of ever-changing global economy, uh, the young people uh, in our communities are going to be growing up and going out into a world that's uh, full of opportunity, but also highly competitive. And so education now more than ever both K through 12 and higher education, advanced education is just essential to the success of our, uh, of our young people. And the Student Opportunity Act, as I said, is sort of a landmark law that addressed uh, some growing shortfalls that were developing in the way we financed education. There was a, a big commission that studied the way we finance public education. And because of a number of factors, um, uh, the, the rising cost of retiree health care, uh, the cost of educating those where English is a second language, um, and, and a whole variety of factors, including, and also poverty, uh, low-income zip codes, that the state was falling behind and meeting the mark to give um, adequate uh, or strong funding to public education. So in this budget, we made a down payment, and over the coming years, we're going to be funding that. Environmental protection got uh, strong funding, uh, criminal justice, implementing criminal justice reform got a good deal of funding. So, uh, and again, the budget has thousands of line items. We could, again, devote just the show to talking <laughs> just about the budget, but those are some of the highlights. And um, when the final thing I'll say on the budget is when the pandemic hit and the downturn in the economy, the consensus among economists and financial forecasters was, was that there might be a that there would be a precipitous fall off in state revenue because uh, our state budget and the revenue we uh, the state collects is highly uh, uh, 
uh, correlated with overall economic conditions. That's not as true, for instance, of local taxes because your the property tax you pay if you own a home in Arlington stays more or less the same in a good economy, a bad economy. But uh, well, what you really mean is it goes up no matter what. <laughs> right, right, right. So, <laughs> but anyway, but, yes. But we wish it stayed the same. <laughs> but with state revenue, think about it: income tax, capital gains tax, sales tax. They all go down in a bad economy. So anyway, the consensus forecast was that we would see a massive shortfall and the need perhaps for deep cuts. And uh, it's kind of confounded in a good way, a lot of experts and legislators that state revenues, although they're still a little below the consensus forecast, they've held up okay. Um, and between that and borrowing from the rainy day fund when, uh, we, and, federal, and federal help, we've been able to put together budgets that have been pretty good uh, all in all. Yeah, I have to say um, a couple of things. One is, you know, talking to both of you a year ago when we obviously didn't know what was in front of us, uh, the, the, the situation just felt so grim on so many levels, but including uh, the fiscal kind of ramifications of, of, of what we were doing, entering lockdown and shutting everything down and uh, seeing, you know, how things would go and, and prioritizing, uh, understandably, public health. Uh, but yeah, it's uh, it's pretty, it's confounding, like you said, but in a wonderful way uh, that, uh, you know, that this, it seems like really good news in this year's budget. The second thing I'd say, as I turn it over to you, Sean, is I remember distinctly, particularly with you, Sean, talking uh, repeatedly over these last five years, I think Dave just mentioned the commission that was created to uh, kind of um, look at the lack of public of, of adequate funding for our education and hearing the frustration in your voice, John, as you would say, yes, these are not being implemented. These recommendations are not being implemented and we need them to be, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah, I'm just happy to share this moment with you, Sean, where I hope that you're happy, happier uh, with, uh, you know, with with the prospects going forward because of what Dave was just describing in terms of the educational provisions in the budget. Yeah, absolutely. And as a former member of the school committee, we, we know that the state was underfunding its commitment to uh, meeting its own mandates on 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 supporting education and you know, this is a great budget. You know, the FY22 budget makes a big investment in the implementation of the Student Opportunity Act, uh, but let's not get ahead of ourselves. There's a lot of commitments that have to be made in the future um, in terms of the appropriation of education across the Commonwealth, but this was a big one. And the fact that we were able to meet the full implementation of that one year during, you know, a, a very concerning budget, concerning economy, I think it says uh, really clearly uh, where our priority is. And as Representative Rogers mentioned uh, the fiscal outlook over the past year, and, and you mentioned it as well, you know, I, I remember, you know, I was serving in the legislature in 2009 when the market collapse nationally impacted our budget here in, in Massachusetts. We lost about $5 billion in revenue between April, between March, uh, April and May. You know, I, I remember, uh, you know, seeing sales tax revenue and, and particularly capital gains tax revenue just plummeting. And at that point, because there was no hope that the economy would rebound over the year or two years, we decided to just go ahead with the House budget, and the Senate did a similar thing. And the House budget, we literally cut billions of dollars in services. We slashed over 200 line items that were very important um, to uh, the people of Massachusetts. And with this, we decided, you know, during the pandemic, that we know revenues because of the shutdown, uh, because of the government policy um, that revenues were not going to pick up and we knew that was going to have a, um, a a negative ramification on our uh, revenues to be able to invest in important programs um, but we also knew that we did not know what the future would look like 
five months, six months, a year down the road. So instead of just cutting the budget, as we did in 2009, we decided to take a, a, a different approach, right? In FY21, we used about 49, 50% of the rainy day fund. Um, and we were, we were very careful on moving forward, but you did not see a huge cut to important services for the people of uh, the Commonwealth. And I think that was a wise decision. Um, I'm very appreciative to um, Speaker DeLeo and now Speaker Mariano, but also Chair Mike Lewitz, who really guided the Commonwealth um, and my colleagues. Just very smart policy. You know, last year, if we had, you know, taken a, a hatchet, if you will, to 200 line items and just cut billions of dollars, um, we really would be in a far worse off scenario because of when you cut, you are literally cutting safety nets for the people of the Commonwealth who really depend on programs and services. Unfortunately, we did not do that. Uh, and we can really get to a place where we build back better, uh, to coin a phrase, um, as we move uh, forward into FY23 and, and, and start moving forward. So, I, you know, I, I am certainly excited um, for the work that, um, that lies ahead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you just mentioned Build Back Better, and it does feel like what you reminded us of is lessons learned from the 2008-2009 crisis and then and, and, and different tactics uh, and more effective ones, it feels like, uh, taken this time around. And that seems both the case here in Massachusetts, but also uh, on the federal level, at least now with the change of administration. Uh, it looks like, uh, you know, President Biden, who was right there, obviously, through out the decisions made in 20, 2008 through 10, uh, you know, recognized you got to go big as as we know that is, is happening. Um, and, uh, you know, let us hope that just like in Massachusetts, it feels like we're getting the benefits of that right now. Let's hope that we're all feeling that way uh, nationally, um, you know, now and, and into the future. Um, Dave, we have we're we're quickly running out of time. Surprise. Um, but we have about 10 minutes left or so. And I wanted to just ask to, again, to, to focus, uh, pick a few things that are priorities for you as you look forward to the next uh, legislative session that you can share with our audience. Sure. Well, and I appreciate the opportunity. I, um, I filed, I think, 70 pieces of legislation this session, which is the most I've ever filed. And I have a lot of interesting projects uh, in the works. Uh, one that I'm pretty excited about because it seems to be gathering momentum, uh, fingers crossed, is uh, a right to counsel bill. Uh, that is, uh, would uh, grant uh, low-income people facing eviction a legal right, a civil right to a lawyer. Um, as we know, uh, low-income defendants in a criminal case are um, uh, given a lawyer, we're all familiar from TV and, and movies with the, the Miranda warning. If, if you cannot afford a lawyer, one will be appointed for you and, and so forth. But that's not true in civil court. And low-income people going to civil court on any issue do not have a right to a lawyer and frequently do not have a lawyer. Um, a matter of fact, we do have civil legal aid societies here in Massachusetts, Greater Boston Legal Services, the Cambridge Somerville Legal Services, uh, with many fine lawyers that provide uh, free uh, or pro bono legal advice to uh, clients, to low-income clients. But unfortunately, the budget for these organizations is such that two-thirds, two-thirds of people seeking that help are turned away and must face our uh, legal system um, without the advice of a lawyer. And I, the way I always say is well, every school child in America is, and all of us familiar with, you know, reciting the Pledge to Allegiance. And at the end, of course, we say, and justice for all. Uh, but the sad fact is it's not true. Uh, we have a legal system that does not really afford equal justice to everyone. I've been working on this for six years now, and it's gathered momentum. The chief justice of our state Supreme Court endorsed it. Uh, former, former Chief Justice, the Boston Globe, our flagship newspaper has endorsed it. Over, over 100 organizations have endorsed it. Believe it or not, uh, even including some property owners, some landlords who find the, 
housing court would be more orderly, more efficient, more rational if um, the tenants had counsel. So uh, I was pleased to pick up support of some landlords. By no means <laughs> all landlords are necessarily a majority of landlords, but some. And, um, and so I jointly filed it with Representative Mike Day uh, from Winchester Stoneham, who's now the chair of the Judiciary Committee, where the bill traditionally has been heard. Um, so, you know, there's no guarantee, uh, but uh, I'm hopeful uh, we have some momentum. Uh, another thing I've been working on was partly wrapped into the uh, police reform bill, that is uh, facial recognition technology. Um, part of the police reform is to put limits on facial recognition technology. What we found out is that the registry of motor vehicles here, uh, the police were rifling through their database looking at um, individual citizens' uh, driver's license photos without a warrant, without any regulation whatsoever. So I filed a bill to put some sensible, you know, rational limits on that. And um, we got part of my bill included in the police reform. And then we formed a commission uh, to uh, study the issue further. Uh, and so police now will have to have proper notice, some safeguards, but we're going to study it further to see if other limits are appropriate. And I was appointed to the commission to study it. That's uh, um, quite an honor. I'm looking forward to the work of the commission as a retired Supreme Court justice on there, uh, some Boston area legal experts and, and others. And we're, we're looking at that. Um, uh, I have a number of bills in the housing area uh, to prevent discrimination in housing uh, that I'll be working on. I did file a rent control bill uh, to look at uh, the issue of rent control. Um, you know, it was banned 27 years ago on the ballot, but I think it was 5149 in a statewide ballot. So it's been a quarter century. It was razor thin when it was banned. Only three cities had it, Cambridge, Boston, and Brookline. So the other 348 cities and towns in the Commonwealth got to vote on it. It barely was defeated. And so I say, well, let's let's kick off that debate. Um, anyway, I know you have limited time. I have 60 some odd other bills. I'd love <laughs> right. to come back and discuss with you. But I joined by my uh, by my colleague, Sean. I want to give him a chance to talk about what he's working on. But those are some of the things I'm working on. Yeah, and absolutely, you know, this is it, it is really wonderful to you and, and, and I particularly like it and, and welcome. Can't wait till we are all in the same room together because I love that the dynamic of that conversation that when we have those. Uh, but we like to get the two of you on together. But I know that it means that you, you know, you don't get to go into the same kind of detail or cover the same amount of material. Each of you. Thanks for your patience, both of you with that, uh, that fact. Sure. Uh, Sean, the last five minutes, uh, uh, the balance of them are yours. And what, what's, what's on your agenda coming up? Well, I, I appreciate this time. It's, uh, I would say it's an aggressive agenda. Um, I appreciate the comments from my great colleague, Rep Rogers. Um, we have filed, um, I think, as many uh, pieces of legislation as Representative Rogers. So uh, between myself and Rep Rogers, the Arlington delegation, <laughs> it's certainly... Uh, uh, taking up all the clerk's time uh, in terms of trying <laughs> to pass important bills. And I, I, that's a fact that uh, I'm proud of. Um, actually, Rep. Rogers and I have authored a bill to add bereavement uh, to the paid family medical leave law, which is just so very important. And we can talk about that at a later date, but I'm, I'm happy to partner with him on, on that important issue. Um, just today, uh, before the Joint Committee on Public Health, I testified in favor, along with about 50 other advocates, on a bill um, that actually passed the House last session, didn't pass the Senate, but we're hoping that this session it will, and that is to grant uh, adoptees in the Commonwealth access to their original birth certificates. So, um, unbeknownst to me, um, there is a law, or I'm not really sure why this happened, but there's a donut hole in, in Massachusetts law. And that is, if you were adopted in the Commonwealth before 1974, you can get your original birth certificate. If you were born after 2008, you can get your original birth certificate. But if you were born between 1974 and 2008, like I was, and so many other adopted 
young P adoptees in the Commonwealth, you cannot get access to your original birth certificate. So we in the Commonwealth have really created three tiered system of people, people who are not adopted and can get their birth certificate, those who are adopted and can get their original birth certificate, and those who are adopted but can't get their original birth certificate. So it's time to close the donut hole, if you will, and give all adoptees uh, their vital records, which really is just about being human. You know, it's about restoring that dignity. So I'm really hoping uh, that bill will pass quickly in the House and then have more time to get it passed in the Senate. Uh, another piece of legislation I'm working on is called the Clean Act, which I have filed with Marjorie Decker, which kind of uh, increases our attention to climate change. You know, what we did at the beginning of this session and last session, uh, passing the roadmap bill was outstanding, uh, but we still believe we can do more and, and should do more. And moving to 100% renewable energy has been a priority of mine for quite some time. The Clean Act installs very uh, important dates and mandates on how to get to clean energy, both in uh, you know, utilities, electricity, but also in uh, transportation and home heating and, and housing and buildings, and, and so really important. But it also uh, talks about uh, transitioning in a just way both with workers and making sure that no worker is left behind as we transition to 100% renewable energy and to focus on environmental justice communities. You know, this bill is really geared towards making sure no one is left behind. We had our kickoff last week. We had over, we had over 150 people on the call. So really a lot of exciting momentum. As Rep. Rogers will uh, surely remind you, uh, as he is our great new chair of higher education. And unfortunately for him, most of my legislation is in either the <laughs> Committee on Children and Families or in the Joint Committee on Higher Education. So he hears from me uh, all the time. There's a uh, hearing next Tuesday. There's a hearing next <laughs> Tuesday. And he was kind enough to tell me that three of my bills, I believe, are coming up Four. for a hearing for my bills. So I'm, I'm excited uh, that he is leading that effort. One is in the aspect, you know, we have been, I would say, uh, BR, which I would stand for before Rogers. <laughs> the legislature uh, has underfunded public higher education. We have 29 campuses of higher learning. Um, over the years, we just have not, in similar to public ed, K through 12, we just have not invested in our 29 campuses of higher learning, which I believe is the lifeblood uh, of, of our economy. Uh, and of the Commonwealth. So I have filed the bill similar to the Student Opportunity Act for K through 12, known as the Cherish Act, which would uh, support state support for public higher education for about $500 million and ho hold fees and tuition flat, not grow. This kind of investment would really, really be critical um, for our, uh, you know, whether it's community college, state universities, or uh, the UMass system. Another piece of legislation, yes. I know we've talked about it before, is around the what we call the Inclusive Concurrent Enrollment Bill. And this is also, unfortunately for Dave, uh, in the Committee on Higher Education, but he's been so good on these issues um, that I, I, and I think he's really enjoying them. And that is, I know we've talked on ACMI quite a bit, around my belief that students with autism and Down syndrome and other disabilities should have the civil right to be able to go to a public higher education institution, um, which is called Macy. And we have a line item in the budget that I work on every year that's over a $2 million line item that allows students to attend if the funding is available, um, but not across the system. And so my bill would really allow students uh, to be able to attend courses uh, to improve the quality of their lives and the prospects of their future uh, and attend one of our 29 institutions of public higher learning. And that's important because if you see, if you look at the research, um, you know, there's over 300 schools that produce colleges that participate across the Commonwealth. And if you study the results from how students with autism and Down syndrome do in terms of independence 
in terms of employment, uh, the level of success for students who are allowed to attend college versus those who are not, it's, it's really like night and day, or day and night. So I'm really hoping that we're going to be able to finally pass this legislation this session. I've been working on this for six years. I will say in the, in the line item, uh, in the budget that we just passed for the first time, um, language that I put in there allows for students with autism and Down syndrome older than 22, if the university uh, allows it, was adopted. And that is really, really important. And I, I would thank the, uh, my colleague, Rep. Rogers, for supporting that. I know he had a lot to do with it. So um, it's really, a, to me, it's a, it's a civil right, and it's about time uh, we do it. Uh, there are several mm -hmm. pieces of legislation uh, that I have filed, but um, those are just kind of a, a highlight of the bills that I am filing. But also, too, there is another bill around DCF to try to really hold the Department of Children and Families accountable so we don't have a situation um, like we did with the unfortunate death of the, um, David Alban from Fall River. It just should not have happened. We really need to prioritize um, the children who are in the care and custody of the Commonwealth. So thanks so much for having both myself and my, my good friend, Dave Rogers, um, on your program today. Yes, and of course, we have gotten to the end of the program as as quickly, it seems, as, as we always do. And we've left lots left to talk about. Um, and, um, you know, we may well follow up with each of you individually to be able to flesh some of those things out a little bit more. Um, again, we want to thank both of you for both your patience with sharing the mic, uh, which is not an easy thing to do, um, and also reminding us that we have very active uh, representation, um, very effective representation, and very committed representation from both of you. Um, the themes that both of you hit on today are familiar from previous conversations, and that just shows that your focus uh, remains uh, strong and clear, and we appreciate that. So I have been speaking uh, with Sean Garbley and Dave Rogers, our state reps, and um, we will talk to them again in the summer for sure, if not before. Um, but thank you guys again for joining us. Thank you for joining us and listening. Thanks, and I'm James Milan. This has been Talk of the Town on behalf of Representatives Garbley and Rogers. We do thank you for joining us and we will see you next time.